Welcome. I'm Evo Dollar, the President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and it's my great honor to welcome all of you here in this room, as well as all of you who are joining us from around the world by live stream. We're delighted to be welcoming this morning Vice President Joe Biden to the Council on Global Affairs. The Vice President will be delivering the fifth Lewis B. Sussman Lecture, which is a lecture series that explores America's role in the world. Vice President Biden has spent his entire career at the forefront of America's foreign relations, and we do look forward uh, to his perspective on how events at home and abroad are transforming the nation's global engagement and its leadership. Following his remarks, I will return to the stage to ask some uh, questions that have been submitted online. But before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. Today's program is on the record. We are live streaming. We welcome your engagement on social media, but if you can do it with your phones turned on silence, that would be appreciated. Finally, the Council on Global Affairs is extremely thankful for the partnership with the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement uh, for this particular event today. Now, it is my, uh, to formally open the program, it's my honor uh, to be welcoming to the stage our Vice Chairman of the Council on Global Affairs and the former United States Ambassador to the Court of St. James, Louis B. Sussman. <laughs> Ambassador Sussman. Uh, thank you, Evo. Uh, <laughs> good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the fourth annual Sussman Transatlantic Lecture Series. <clears throat> it's an honor uh, to welcome Vice President Biden to the Chicago Council of Global Affairs. Uh, this time last year, America was in the final days of a long and divisive presidential campaign. In many ways, the election marked a dramatic shift in America's relationship with the world. Since World War II, two presidents of both parties have made the case for an active United States engagement and leadership in the world. How, <clears throat> last November, however, we entered a new era of America first and disengagement and demise of American leadership in the world. While this change may seem dramatic, and it is, hopefully America will not turn its back on global engagement and leadership. I am passionate, and the Consul is passionate, in moving forward the importance of alliances, immigration, trade, and engaging the next generation of leaders. After uh, Vice President Biden shares this similar passion, I can tell you. After leaving office, he formed the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement at the University of Pennsylvania and continues this vitally crucial work. Vice President Biden was elected to the U.S. Senate, representing Delaware at the ripe old age of 29. He served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. <laughs> You're always stealing my lines. <laughs> you heard he worked on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as chairman and was able to shape our policy in so many areas, including the Balkans and nonproliferation. Of course, from 2009 to 2017, he served as the 47th Vice President of the United States alongside President Obama, during which he played a crucial and central role in the diplomacy. I was fortunate to be with President Obama two weeks ago, and he personally reinforced his love, affection, and respect for Joe, and reiterated that whatever the problem was, domestic or foreign, the first person he called for help was Joe Biden. Joe has now finished writing a book, his memoirs, 
which I can't wait to read, and I'm plugging it, Joe, for everybody to read. <laughs> now, in conclusion, I'd like to give you a personal view of my friend, Joe Biden, who I have known for over 40 years. We have been through presidential campaigns together. I have listened many times to Joe's incredible late mother, who would always say to me, take care of my boy, Joey. And that was important. There were wonderful Thanksgivings in Nantucket together. And how much fun was it to watch the Vice President of the United States plunge into the cold Atlantic to participate in a terrible polar turkey plunge, especially with the Secret Service detail following him <laughs> with suits and guns. <clears throat> the thrill of the we had, Marjorie and I, when he visited us in London, and of course my many visits with him in his house in Washington, D.C. And Joe, let us never forget the times we all had to listen to your favorite Irish poet, uh, she Seamus Heaney. I want to end by saying, Joe has made a many wonderful decisions, but my, my opinion is best was getting him, getting Jill Biden to marry you. Jill is his passionate love, partner and guiding light, and we miss her here today. Vice President Biden has led the quintessential American life and the American dream. From Scranton to the White House, a journey with plenty of ups and downs, but through it all, he always remained Joe from Scranton, connected to a core set of values that are what makes America truly great. And most important, a core sense of decency that made him a friend to all, no matter their party, their affiliation, or their beliefs. It is over my overwhelming honor to introduce Vice President Joseph Biden. Hi, everybody. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Lou, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been coming to Chicago a long time. And uh, I got started in politics as a kid um, when uh, Billy's dad was the mayor. So I'm used to coming to Chicago and always thanking the Daily for the passport. So, Billy, thanks for the passport to come in. I, uh, um, and uh, it is true, uh, Lou is extremely generous for I don't know how many years. Uh, on Thanksgiving, would offer my entire family, which means about 15 of us, um, uh, his home in Nantucket. And the first year we were there, uh, my, how many of you have granddaughters? Raise your hands. Okay. Now, as a grandfather, is there anything you've ever said no to your granddaughter? <laughs> I have four. They own me. <laughs> I tell them the same thing I told my daughter. Just understand, I know you're using me. <laughs> Just give me credit for knowing I know you're using me. Don't think I'm stupid. Well, the first year we were there, it was literally, uh, you know, like 38 degrees just above freezing. And they said, Pop, let's walk down to the beach. And we got down to the beach, and uh, someone said, are you, are you, are you going to do the polar plunge? And it is cold. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. And my number two granddaughter said, my Pop can do anything. <laughs> and then all three of them, there were only three then, got together and said, Pop, come on. you got to do it. And uh, I've done it every year since, which reinforces that I'm certifiably unqualified to hold about any office. <laughs> Folks, uh, thank you for having me back. This, I, uh, your former president, who I've uh, known for a long time, has had me out here uh, for, I think, four, maybe more times since uh, 1972. Um, but uh, this is the first time I've got to be here for uh, this series. And uh, 
I'm flattered Lou would invite me. Everybody said, thank you for coming. And I said, again, like my granddaughter, I've never told Lou no. So there's no. <laughs> but I am delighted to be here. And uh, particularly uh, um, uh, with Ambassador Lalder. Uh, Evo and I have been friends for a long, long time. I don't know anyone who is more qualified, I really mean this sincerely, more knowledgeable and more focused on every single assignment he has ever had in the federal government. And uh, having Evo at NATO at a very, very difficult time. Evo, and I'm not going to spill the beans here, but even now we're talking about we are mutual concern of what Putin's doing in Europe. We needed someone with a strong, knowledgeable, and convincing voice at NATO, and you did an incredible job, Evo. Thank you very, very much for what you did. And Lou may be the most natural ambassador uh, uh, I've ever seen. Um, and I've, I've, uh, I've never seen someone take to the role so well. The President and I knew that our special relationship with Great Britain was going to be in really good hands, but we didn't expect it to grow and mature under, the st under her stewardship, which is amazing. And when Jill and I, uh, when, when uh, they hosted us uh, at uh, London back in 2013, I was struck. And I mean this sincerely. I've been doing this a long, long time. I've got a chance to meet literally every major world leader in the last 42 years. And, uh, and you can tell when people, uh, leaders in foreign countries, genuinely, genuinely listen to and have respect for an ambassador. And it was obvious how you had earned the respect of the British leadership, Lou, and it, it served us very well at a very rocky time for Britain as well, going through some self-doubt, which they're still going through right now, in my view. I've never seen, as an editorial comment, I've never seen Europe as unsure of itself as it is right now, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit about, why we so desperately need, and the world so desperately needs American leadership. So it's, it's great to be back, and I ask, I thank the Council for having me today. You know, during uh, my time in public office, I've observed uh, a simple truth, that America's ability to lead the world is not driven just by the example of our power, but by the power of our example as well. Think about why the rest of the world repairs to us since World War II. It's not just the example of our power. It's the power of our example. As long as I've been in public life, the United States has earned the respect of the world when we've led with our values. And while at times there's been a gap between our ideals and the practice of our politics, we have set ourselves apart by our willingness to advance not just our own interests, but the universal interest and the aspirations shared by all people around the world. We've invested in the success and security of not just us, but others, because we have known it would benefit us as well. New allies to deter aggression, new partners to meet imminently and increasingly complex challenges, new markets for our products. Because of that, nations have rallied to our side not through the use of coercion, but they've come willingly and freely. We've built the most remarkable network of alliances and partnerships unique in modern Europe and in, in modern history. It's a network of alliances and institutions that were built after World War II to advance our shared, our shared economic and physical security interests. And is undergirded by a liberal international order that served us and the world well since the end of World War II. But today, I worry we're walking down a very dark path that isolates the United States on the world stage, endangers the American people, and with other international events taking place that are tearing at the fabric of a liberal world order, is even more dangerous. Around the world, including the United States, we're seeing a shift toward a theory of foreign policy that's closed and clannish, one that groups the world into us and them, 
rather than building on the shared narrative of freedom and democracy that has inspired nations around common goals. This administration's cost, well, let me say it another way. It casts, and the casting cost, global affairs in a dog-eat-dog -dog competition. A Hobson world in which, for America to succeed, others must lose or fail. Among the many problems plaguing this administration's foreign policy, in my view, beyond ideological incoherence, inconsistent and confusing and erratic decision-making, <laughs> is an unwillingness or inability to solve problems caused by as simple a thing as totally understaffing our entire diplomatic and national security apparatus. Even I can take you up in the seventh floor and you can holler and hear an echo. That's almost literally true. It's bizarre. But what I find most disturbing is the zero-sum thinking. It's especially counterproductive in a moment when we're dealing with multiple security crises that are at a boiling point. The actions taken by this administration, I think, are making it harder for us to meet the challenges we face undermining our credibility on the international stage, abandoning the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I know, by the way, it's not meant as a compliment in Washington. I'm known as Middle Class Joe. It meant that I'm not so sophisticated. I'm from Scranton and Wilmington. But I'm pretty damn sophisticated about why we're who we are. And it's been a middle class with aspirations and a way up for people. But today, today, in order to deal with the problems of fear that occur in much of the heartland as well as back east in the industrial states, we're yielding to all the wrong impulses, walking away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, leaving the stage to China to set the new rules of engagement. The Paris Agreement repeatedly, repeatedly questioning America's sacred commitment to NATO, decertifying Iran's compliance with the nuclear deal against all the evidence, even against the advice of its own national security leadership. This administration is calling into question what the word of the United States means anymore. What is it worth? It matters. I have spoken and been contacted over 14 heads of state, all wanting me to visit them, or they've come to visit me. It's a difficult place to be, because I never would say anything negative about any American president overseas, and it's not my place to explain their policy. How many of you, when, and I mean this sincerely, how many of you, when the president was elected, were either happy or bemused or a little embarrassed or not quite sure, but not, not really fundamentally worried about our democracy or the prospect of an international conflict, a nuclear war? How many of you now? whether you voted for him or not, are beginning to wonder whether or not the very roots, the moral fabric, the invisible moral fabric that holds, is the buoyancy that holds everything up, is eroding in a way that is literally dangerous for our democratic institutions. No, I, I really wasn't asking for a show of hands, but <laughs> I, I didn't mean to do that to you. But I notice most of you raise your hand. <laughs> but all kidding aside, we're, we're, we're in a different territory here. I've served with eight presidents. This is the ninth president I've known. The president's, President Trump's, America First sloganeering isolates us in the world. At a moment when few of any of the threats 
of today's threats can be met without broad international effort and consensus, grounded in mutual interest and mutual respect, shared values. It plays right into the hands of those who seek to decompose the community of democracies in favor of a more parochial international order, one where power rules and spheres of influence once again pertain, divide, and weaken nations, one where the whole is decidedly, decidedly less than the sum of the parts. This is no time for the United States to seal the seed the field to the forces of illiberalism and intolerance. Evo and I were talking about, we've each written articles recently about Putin's plan in Europe. It's real. If we don't step up the liberal world order we've championed, we'll quickly become an illiberal world order we suffer. A world where our adversaries are going to exploit the system for their own purposes. And that is, of course, why the illiberal movement is led by President Vladimir Putin. Putin and his cronies want only to preserve their wealth and their power. And they've decided that the best way to do that, the best way to achieve that outcome, is not to address the sources of instability in their own country, but through a multifaceted attack on the United States that seeks to, one, undermine faith in our democratic institutions while working to peel away our international allies. The Kremlin assault on Western democracy aims to achieve three interrelated goals, in my view. One, to weaken and divide democratic states, literally stoking discord and exacerbating the existing political and ideological, ethnic and racial cleavages. Secondly, to create divisions to undermine consensus in the transatlantic community by setting members of the NATO and the EU against one another. And thirdly, to delegitimize the roles of the international order, particularly those that promote democratic accountability, transparency, and the rule of law. And to achieve these goals, the Kremlin is using the 21st century twist on the old Cold War playbook. It's taking advantage of globalization of communications, media, and markets to undermine democratic institutions from within, planning malware to inflate, excuse me, to infiltrate cyber networks polluting the media with disinformation, using access to energy to exert political influence, channeling financial resources to corrupt and political arenas throughout Europe. We know what they're doing, because we've seen it done successfully by Moscow's successful beta tests of these methods in their neighbors on Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Montenegro. And now the Kremlin is now using these same asymmetric tactics to subvert the very institutions that make our Western democracies and open societies so successful. The free market, the free press, and free elections. Russia's attack on our election was not an isolated incident. It wasn't an unattended consequence of an overcharged propaganda machine. It was purposeful, and it's ongoing. The efforts to spew disinformation, infiltrate our networks, corrupt our political institutions, they continue. And we'll surely see this kick into full gear as we head into another cr critical congressional election cycle in 2018. Yesterday, the representatives from the tech industry around Capitol Hill talking about the extent to which Russian disinformation operations operated on U.S. social media. The numbers are staggering, and it is targeted. But Germany's seen this. Most European countries have seen this. According to their testimony, which accounted only for the activity of the Internet Research Agency, a mega troll farm outside of St. Petersburg, as many as 126 million Facebook users saw content produced by Russian operatives. Tens of thousands of Russian bots were tweeting more than 1,000 videos on YouTube, all false. If the Kremlin thinks it can successfully compete using these tactics, it's going to continue to use them to fuel an assault on Western democracies. The threat that Russia poses to our national security and that of our democratic partners and allies is fundamentally different from the ideological threat the Soviet Union posed during the Cold War. But it's no less real, 
and we need to take it seriously. Appeasement will not work. So far, our sitting president has been unwilling to call out Putin for Russia's meddling in our democracy or criticize his actions. Astonishing. Fortunately, we have three co-equal branches of government, notwithstanding the effort to undermine the judiciary and to minimize the Congress. The United States Congress is not giving Mr. Putin a pass. By huge majorities, Congress codified the sanctions the Obama-Biden administration put in place and created new authorities for this administration to apply pressure on Europe. And the administration took the right step recently by announcing thorough sanctions on Russia's defense and intelligence sectors last week. There's still no public utterance about how bad this is. But at the same time, we've heard that the State Department, in the midst of all this, the State Department is disbanding the Office of Sanction Coordination. I mean, affirmatively disbanding the Office of Sanction Coordination, which was set up to do with sanctions against Iran, I mean, across the board. So we have to keep watching to see how these sanctions are implemented and how the administration defines certain key terms of the legislation. President Trump needs to listen to those bipartisan voices in Congress and the good counselors within his own administration who advocate supporting Ukraine pushing back Russia meddling in Western democracy, demanding accountability for Russia's brazen interference in our election. Putin and his cronies seek to return to a world where strong, the strong impose their will through arms, corruption, and criminality on their weaker neighbors on their borders. In return, his effort, in my view, is an attempt to return to spheres of influence the United States has explicitly rejected for decades as a politics at odds with our values and the vision built and sustained by a liberal world order. President Obama asked me to make the first major foreign policy speech of our administration in 2009 at the Munich conference. It had only been in office a matter of weeks. But we wanted to lay down an early, clear marker. In that speech, I said, and I quote, we will not recognize any nation having a sphere of influence. It will remain our view that sovereign states have the right to make their own decisions and choose their own alliances, end of quote. Today, instead, we're seeing appeals to, and I quote John McCain here when I presented him with the Liberty Medal at the Constitution Center where I'm the president. He talked about phony populism and spurious nationalism. I strongly recommend you read my colleague's speech. You can get it online. We're seeing forces here in the United States seek to manipulate and exploit the legitimate concern that people feel, and a full disclosure that my party is not fully res responding to. There's a lot of people out there scared to death with good reason. They come from my old neighborhoods. They're not stupid. They have real fears. And that's not based on race. We, a black man, won all those places two times in a row before. Toughest speech I ever had to make, Lou, was I was asked by World Economic Forum to be the keynote speaker on the fourth revolution. Will there be middle-class jobs? I just came from a Google Zeitgeist that I, they asked me to speak at. There's a reason why Silicon Valley, not just because they care, but is proposing for an annual guaranteed income for Americans. These folks have reason to be scared. The neighborhood I grew up in, if you had a your dad was a long-haul truck driver. Today, you can make 80, 90,000 bucks a year. Raise your hand if you think there's going to be long-haul trucking driven by people making 80, 90,000 bucks a year in 10 years from now. These people aren't prejudiced. They're realistic. They're realistic. 
and they become targets to charlatans. And that's what, look what happens. Like most charlatans throughout time, who seek to aggrandize themselves and consolidate their power by always blaming the other. Why am I not going to have my job? The other. That immigrant took my job. Why don't have my job? They spent too much time coddling poor folks and black folks. The other is the reason why I'm not doing well. Their proposal, hunker down, shut the gates, build walls. Again, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but how many of you believe the populism of this administration is really directed at worrying about the plight of the poor? <laughs> no, I'm serious. But all those answers that are being sold to a relatively small sliver, we would not be having this conversation but for 72,000 votes. But it's taking root. It can only offer a false sense of safety while degrading our standing in our society and our prosperity in the international community. And it's obscene. It also obscures the common sense solutions that, that would help raise the standard of living for working class people, increasing access to education, job training, ensuring basic protection for workers, expanding access to capital, implementing progressive equitable tax system where everyone pays their fair share, and providing the financial resources to make colleges affordable and rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. We could put every single solitary kid in college for free, community college, increasing the growth of the GBT, GB, the gross domestic product, <laughs> by 2% a year, by doing one thing, eliminating stepped-up basis. You're the only ones that know what stepped-up basis is. No, I'm not being facetious. We have $1,340,000,000,000 in tax expenditures now in the, in, in the code. We used to have 780 when Reagan was president. It cost $16 billion a year out of the trillion, 300 billion plus. You could put every kid in college and reduce the deficit. Reduce the deficit by $11 billion. Don't tell me we can't do these things. We need to take action to mitigate the economic trends that are stoking unrest and undermining people's basic sense of dignity, not only here, but internationally. Because if we don't, we risk eroding from inside out the foundations of the system that spawned the West's, the West's historical unprecedented success. To maintain this liberal world order, we need to tap into the big heartedness that conceived the Marshall Plan, the foresight that planned Bretton Woods, the boldness and vision that proposed the United States. We can rout fear. We can't do it, though, with retrenchment. This is the moment to lead boldly and recommit ourselves to common principles, which remain essential to the United States and to the liberal democracies of the world. We can't wait for others to write the future that we hope to see. It has to start with the United States. The United States must lead the world with Europe and our allies to defend these values that have brought us to where we are today. To win this fight, we have to continue to invest our democratic in our democratic alliances, standing with partners in Europe. The unity of transatlantic connections is essential to addressing every global challenge, as it has been for the last seven decades. It's the single greatest bulwark for our transatlantic partnership. It's an uns unshakable commitment at least we thought so to this president, to Article 5 of the NATO agreement. An attack on one is an attack on all. There should never be a question of that, not for a moment, because once you question those who live in the shadow of the bear begin to accommodate, begin to conclude they have no place to go. And without us, no one else no other nation has the capacity to lead these alliances. Defending the liberal international order also requires to resist the forces in Europe that call for disintegration and maintain our long-standing insistence on a Europe whole, free, and at peace. 
It means fighting for the European Union, one of the most vibrant, consequential institutions on Earth. The EU has continued to be and provide prosperity for millions, fueling reforms after uh, improving living standards, driving peaceful resolution of disputes between nations. It can constantly and needs to be constantly reformed, as every institution does. But it means keeping the door open for membership in the European and transatlantic institutions to those states in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, on the edge, places like the Balkans, Ukraine. They continue to yearn to be part of an incredible undertaking that's called the European Union. America's always led, but not alone. After World War II, during the depths of the Cold War, right through the day, we've led. The United States, our NATO allies, all the nations of Europe, we're all in this together. The oldest democracies in the world, united by our, our, our other fellow democratic states, we have a responsibility to beat back these challenges at our door, rather than yielding to them. And we must never forget how we got here or take for granted this success will continue. I don't want to walk out of here, anyone thinking that there isn't any hope. I think there is hope. I'm not pessimistic about the fate of the world. If you just get up, just get up. Look at who the hell we are. We have the human capacity to meet challenges with ingenuity, to reinvent, to reconceive. It's limitless. This is America. Think about it. Most of us are raised in the circumstance where we were taught and believed that America could do anything if it set its mind to it. What the hell has happened? Just take, for example, the very idea of a European whole, free, and at peace. In my opinion, that constitutes one of the most audacious and consequential visions in the past century. Think about it. After centuries of conflict and war, Europe could become integrated, a community of political solidity, free flow of goods and people, and a solemn obligation to collective defense. It was a bold idea. But the United States believed in it, people across Europe believed in it, aspired to it, and succeeded in achieving it. The European enterprise was essential to the American century and to the new American century. Our Atlantic Alliance remains today the bedrock, allowing us to address threats from terrorism to the spread of diseases like Ebola to climate change. But it's only by continuing to invest in our shared security, reaffirming our common values, expanding the cause of liberty around the world, that the United States will remain in a position of leadership. And here, too, I remain optimistic about the future of our country and the capacity to lead the world. I'll conclude, folks, by saying we are better positioned than any nation in the world to own the 21st century. Not only do we have the most powerful military in the world, we have the most productive workers in the world, three times as productive as Asia. The most agile system of venture capitalism. The greatest research universities in the world. We have more great research universities in the United States of America than all the rest of the world combined because of a guy named Eisenhower. After Sputnik, he had a committee of 20 wise men. It would be 20 wise people today. They insisted that they invested all in the government. He said, no, no. We'll invest some in the government. We're going to go out and invest in all these great universities, almost in every state. Name me a single new product, a single new invention that has fundamentally changed the world for the better that wasn't found here and didn't start in our research universities. I was down at Google with Eric Schmidt. He stood up and acknowledged there would be no Google without our investment in pure research. The algorithm used came out of Stanford University from a student who was tuition was paid for by the United States government. We're the new epicenter of energy. North America, for the reign of this century, it's not the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. It is not South America. It is not Iraq and Iran. It's North America. We have the resources and the resourcefulness to overcome our challenges to create that better future we all seek. And folks, 
I've spent more time with Xi Jinping than any world leader. I've spent 25 hours of private dinners with him. I've traveled 17,000 miles with him in China and 7,000 miles here because the two former presidents thought we should get to know one another. I don't want his problems. I want China to succeed. The idea they're going to eat our lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, they don't have enough energy. They don't have enough water. They're talking about it. No, not a joke. They're talking about a $2 trillion project to change the direction of the two major rivers. Over 35% estimated of their arable land is polluted with cadmium. And the list goes on. I want them to succeed. Every time I'd say that to Xi, he'd say, why? I said, so we can sell you our products. <laughs> and there's one more reason to be optimistic. The American people are squarely behind continuing to play a robust leading role in the world. Just last month, you guys, the Chicago Council, released a new survey that looked explicitly at the public opinion trends for questions that get at the idea of America first. The results? Almost two-thirds of the American people support the United States continuing to play an active and engaged role in the world, not us versus them. Almost half believe that maintaining our alliances is a very effective way, more effective than maintaining our military power. our overwhelming military power. So while it's clear there's a lot of division between the extremes of both our parties, there's actually a lot more agreement among the American people than the pundits acknowledge. And we can't use that as an excuse to think everything's going to be okay and become complacent. We have to use the knowledge to motivate us, to remain vigilant. We have to use unity to fight the misguided and dangerous policies of this administration, to fight to create more equitable and more inclusive growth for people at every level, fight for democracy wherever it is under threat, at home and abroad, fight to defend the ideals that make us who we are, where we can continue to lead by our example, fight to lift up the forces of inclusivity and opposing tolerance in all guises, fight to urge Fight the urge to embrace nationalism and protectionism. Folks, last thing I'll say. Did any of you ever think you would see, and I mean this literally, in a great American city, Nazis coming out from under the rocks in the fields, out of the fields in the dark, carrying torches, reciting the same anti-Semitic bile the same anti-Semitic bile that brought down Europe. Did you ever think that would occur? And those who came to oppose them would be judged in relative terms as them both causing problems. Ladies and gentlemen, silence is complicity. Silence is complicity. One of the reasons they wanted to be here, you're among the most influential people in the country. So continue to speak up and speak out. Thank you. Why do I feel like I'm going through graduate school here and I'm about to defend my thesis? I spent too many times having you asking me questions. That's now true. I That's what it. worries me. <laughs> I think I speak, speak for all of uh, uh, us here by thanking you for that uh, defense of our engagement in the world, our leadership, the liberal international order, and particularly the optimism that you express uh, because there are times when people find it hard to be optimistic, and I think 
expressing that in the way you did is, uh, is what we all are looking for. Uh, we uh, opened up online for asking some questions, and uh, I have a couple of here that we, uh, that, that we have selected that I wanted to uh, bring to you. First is on China. You addressed China uh, at the end and asked and talked about the importance of China succeeding. How, in the view, in, in the face of our uh, problems in North Korea, in the South China Sea, in the uh, deliberate attempt to, to prevent us from accessing their markets, um, and China's really interest in getting us out of the region, what should be our policy now towards well, this very important country? I think it's, it's the, you know, as they used to say, the $64 question here, and I think there's an answer. One, with regard to China exercising its muscle in the South China Sea, I'll give you one example, and Billy Daly may remember. I was asked to, I, I went to meet with Xi a couple years before we were out of office, and he, uh, because I had spent some time with him, he put on a state dinner for me. And, uh, and we had a five-hour meeting with his national security people and mine, all the people you know, Tony Blinken and a lot of others. And um, he had, they had just uh, established the air identification zone that they said was there. And uh, this was three days before I got there. And I looked at him, I said, Mr. President, you understand that what you're proposing, what you've just announced is illegal internationally. You understand we're not going to pay. So what do you expect me to do? I said, I don't expect you to do anything, except we're not paying any attention to it. And after discussing this before with the, the, the president, we threw a B, we flew a B-53, B-52, and then a B-1 bomber through it. I said, just understand. And he asked me, he said, what makes you think you're a Pacific power? You keep saying you're Pacific power. I said, we are Pacific power. And your stability would not exist without us being a Pacific power. And he looked at me and said, you're right. But they're looking, and I'll give you one other example. In TPP, I was there in the last negotiation and meeting with him. And after this meeting, uh, we walked out, and it looked like we were about to get TPP. And on the way out, he pulled me aside. I can now say this. Pulled me aside, and he said, if you get this agreement, can we join? Not a, by, by the way, not, not a joke. It was not a joke. It would have had 40% of the world's GDP. South America, North America, and the Pacific Basin. We would then have written the rules of the road, what constitutes fair trade. With regard to the way they deal with us, we should begin to deal in kind. Now, there are exceptions in the WTO that they're getting the question of a merging nation and a, you know, and, and a mature nation. But we have much more leverage on China in terms of, uh, and I'm talking to some people in the front row who've done a lot of business and major business with China. We have much more leverage with China in terms of what, who can afford to threaten and get engaged in a trade war. I'm not, I'm not proposing a trade war. But they have much, 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 much more to lose than we do. Lastly, with regard to North Korea, we have to realize that China is, uh, practically speaking, uh, uh, very, I think uh, she, she's afraid of two things. One, he's afraid of laying down a declaration to, as the president described him, the young man who heads up a government like a kid in a high chair beating him with a spoon, um, because he's afraid he won't listen, and China's standing will be diminished in the world. So what I think we're doing, and part we're doing now, is we should be moving forward basing our defense capabilities, which Leslie, you know a great deal about, our defense capabilities, and making it clear to China that it's not about them, but the PRC, the military, is pushing on the government establishment to say, no, no, they're trying to surround us. My response to she was, if in fact Mexico was threatening to attack China, what would you do? You say, well, no problem. No problem. So, but what we got to stop doing, you got to stop, you know, big nations can't bluff. And what the president doesn't realize, drawing all these red lines with regard to North Korea and then not following up, diminishes our power around the world. 
sends out signals that are dangerous. And so we've got to stop this tweeting. We've got to stop this sort of... No, no it, it, it is so... I've tried to stay out of the mosh pit, the President and I, Obama and I have. But it's childish. It's time to grow up. It's time to grow up and act like the world leader. But it's difficult. I'm tempted to ask about red lines, but I won't. Um, uh, I want to talk about... <laughs> I know which one you're going to talk about, yeah. too. Um, because I'm only asking questions that were submitted online, so... That, that's a help. That's that, that, that was the deal. Uh, President Trump... Ask me who you want to ask me for real. No. Well, so let's talk about the red line. I mean, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, the, re the red lines that the President Trump has drawn. I remember Steve Hadley saying about red lines vis-a-vis -vis Iran is the problem they keep crossing them. Of course, your administration, our administration, your, your president, our president, all of our presidents drew a red line in Syria and uh, had, a, had, a, had a, a, a response that ultimately did remove the chemical weapons, but it didn't lead to the military force that was used. So. One of the things Billy uh, Daly will remember, that's why he thought about primarying me, finding someone to primary me for vice president, uh, get, get rid of me. I made it real clear what I thought about the red line. But what the president did do is the president was able to legitimately turn and say what he believed, that constitutionally we did not have the power to do what he threatened without congressional consent. I actually sat down with 147 members of Congress all Republicans in groups as small as two and as big as 25 in the Situation Room to try to get their support to allow us to have the authority to, for the President to respond to the red line. And uh, I could only get four Republicans. So the end result was we ended up with an agreement that got the nuclear weapons, but... Uh, chemical, chemical. I mean, chemical weapons, but it is... Uh, um, I, I don't think you saw the President approaching it that way um, since then. But in fairness to him, he believed that constitutionally, for us to use to strike the Syrian government, no matter how focused it was, required under the War Powers Act the consent of the Congress, and we couldn't get it. Iran, uh, decertification of the Iran deal by President Trump, what uh, question uh, what, what does this mean for our relationship with uh, folks in the region, some of whom are very supportive of this move, and with those uh, countries uh, who are co-signers of the agreement? I think it's a net loss if you balance those two. And by the way, one of those nations where the prime minister strongly supports it, the defense establishment of his country didn't support it, as well as the security establishment, as well as other former leaders like Ehud Barak and others. Um, uh, so there's a split, not, uh, number one. Number two, the way to look at this, folks, is Iran is doing bad things. They're supporting bad people. We knew that from the front end of this, uh, the, this deal. And they're screwing around with, with their missile technology, which we knew from the beginning was possible. I just ask you to contemplate them doing all they're doing with a nuclear weapon. All that they're doing, the bad things, with a nuclear weapon. And everyone agrees that this agreement has pushed back, and they're sustaining it, their ability to get a nuke way back and gives us at least 15 months advance notice to if they were even beginning to try again. So there are other ways to deal. <coughs> There's other ways to deal with the activity. There's nothing prohibits us from instituting a foreign policy that involves the use of force to deal with the bad actors that they're promoting. But it is a bad deal to un it's a bad it would be a bad deal to undo the deal in terms of our national security. Secondly, I know these are essay questions. I'll try to do yes or no quicker, but <laughs> secondly, it will undermine our leadership in Europe among the nations that are co signers, absent Russia. Thirdly, it will send a message to North Korea down the road that there's no deal you can make with the United States, even if there is a, I don't see any deal in the immediate 
uh, um, offing with North Korea, but I do see a deal over the next several years as a possibility of denuclearizing that area. But uh, who, who's going to sign a deal with us if we can't, if we have no basis upon which other than, which is allowed, the president can just, by fiat, say, I'm out. I think you're going to see the Congress go out of their way to preserve the deal by making some minuscule change. At least that's my expectation. I spent a lot of time talking about Russia, uh, a, a mutual interest of ours. Uh, you want to, as I do, I think many of us want, a tough approach given the threat that Russia poses. Question is, how do we maintain a tough approach without dragging into either a real Cold War or potentially even a hot war. What's the right way of managing that relationship that maximizes our counter pressure, but also reduces the risk of accidental and unintentional conflict? It's interesting to, uh, to note, and I think, Evo, you'd agree, although I'm, I haven't talked to you about this. The vast majority of the, Ru the Russian population does not want Russian forces in Central and Eastern Europe. Example, several years ago, because I was given Ukraine as my responsibility, several years ago, Putin issued a gag order throughout Russia that no one was allowed under penalty of law to take a picture of or announce in a press a Russian body bag coming back to, to Russia because there's overwhelming opposition in Russia to using force and losing Russian soldiers' lives in Europe for something they don't want, number one. Number two, so he has a political reality he has to face. And you say, well, he has no concerns. He's still at, at 80%. The truth is, you remember the last election, he got very, very nervous. It didn't take much to ignite hundreds of thousands of Russians. And remember, this is called the Russian Federation, but it's overwhelmingly minority Russian. Overwhelming minority. There's only 148,000 folks in that federation now. And so the idea this is a coherent, a coherent country that is held together other than by the fiat of a single president leads you to understand why Putin is so concerned about any crack in this operation. And we have to call his bluff, just like we have done in Ukraine after he took Crimea, which I think the president wasn't sure had happened, um, but um, the present president. Um, but. What happens is, this is a guy who doesn't have that strong a hand to deal with. He doesn't have a very strong hand. He's tried very hard to reconnect with China, and he's basically getting a stiff arm, number one. Number two, he is really a second-rate power, economically and militarily, but for the nuclear weapons that he possesses. On the periphery, he's a dominant power. And so I am not so certain that we will get anywhere near a shooting war if we continue to mobilize European unity in saying, this is, this is the backstop. That's why, under your leadership, when we both went to uh, the last two major NATO conferences, we came up with a plan to forward deploy more forces, to say, okay, man, this is not 1939. Understand, this is the deal. And so, and the response to that has not been what some feared, that all of a sudden you have massive Russian forces moving up on the border, et cetera. So I, I think we just have to play to our strength. We don't have to be bellicose. We still should cooperate with Russia where it makes sense. If Russia tomorrow wanted to, if you were president and I was your Secretary of State and Russia tomorrow wanted to engage in uh, a major effort on climate change and renewable energy, I'd say we should do it at the very time saying, but here's the deal, no sphere of influence. 
So I, I think we underestimate, but all, the, all of that evaporates when the rest of Europe looks at us and says, I don't know, man. What's this us or them stuff? Where are we? Where do we sit in that equation? We're out of time, but I have one most important question. There are a lot of young people in this audience, either here in person or watching us online. And how do we help uh, to ensure that they engage in the world in the way that your generation did, uh, given the current climate we have? What can you tell them to become as engaged globally as, we, as you think is necessary? Look, um, there, there's a new little book that's published. I can't remember the author's name. You may remember it called Tyranny. It's a no, no, number three in the bestseller list, a little tiny paperback. Um, and uh, it's about silence. It's about non-participation. You know, uh, when I walked across the stage, received my diploma in 1968 um, from Syracuse Law School, uh, the only hero, only two heroes I ever had, uh, had just been shot and killed. Uh, uh, Dr. King was shot, resulting in my city of Wilmington being the only city since the Civil War occupied by the military for nine months because so much of it was burned down. We were a slave state. We were a border state. We have a large black population. And uh, the second thing that happened was the only political career I ever had was Robert Kennedy. And uh, um, he was assassinated about, as I walked across the stage later that day. And uh, that did two things to my generation. I know none of you women are old enough to know this, but some of you men are. Um, <laughs> remember, our generation was told to drop out head to hate Asbury. Don't trust anybody over 30. And a lot of people did. And we're not participating in, the, in 63, 4, 5, 6, 7. But what happened then goes back to the question I ask you, do you feel a greater sense of urgency today than you did six months ago? For this generation, there's an overwhelming sense of urgency. Someone here said, I did Harvard's class day and Yale's class day, and this particular person, I won't embarrass him, said, or give him credit, um, uh, and said, I was amazed. They all stood up and gave you a standing ovation. Um, what I talked about there was uh, um, things got so bad, my generation couldn't hide its eyes anymore. I walked across that stage, and I come from modest means, no Horatio Alger story, just normal split-level house, 2,300 square feet, four kids, and a parent, and a, and a grandparent living with us. And, uh, and I was determined we're going to change the damn world. I really was. I really was determined, my generation, because things got so bad. We just couldn't stop anymore. Now, millennials, according to the Shorenstein uh, um, school at, at, at Harvard, the day I spoke up there, um, had put out a survey showing that millennials are up to age, uh, was it, 39? Uh, 35. Uh, thir 35. That millennials, uh, um, when we were in office, they thought that uh, um, they're the most engaged uh, generation in history. They're the largest now, by the way, 75.8 million versus 74 for the baby boomers. Um, and uh, um, and they, they're, they're the most tolerant, they're the most open administration, uh, uh, generation in American history, et cetera, except one thing. It was up to 45% said, yeah, they'd consider being involved in public life. They'd consider running for office. It's now down to 7%. Um, for women, and I think it's 14 percent for, for uh, young men. And uh, I remember when I was asked, because they couldn't find anybody else to run for the Senate when I was 29, I had, you know, this literally would happen. Um, <laughs> uh, and I went to see a legendary professor of political science at Delaware. Every school has one person who everybody, his name was Professor Dolan. And uh, another guy named Dr. Ingersoll, they were together. And I said, what do you think? Expecting them to say, yeah, you're, look, you're not even, I wasn't even constitutionally eligible 
to get elected. I mean, you have to be 30 years old. I was 29 on election day. 17 days later, I, I became eligible. And I'll never forget what Dr. Ingersoll said to me. And I hope young people are listening. He said, remember that Plato quote, I'm paraphrasing, the penalty good people pay for not being involved in politics is being governed by people worse than themselves. And I say to all that generation, there's no place for you to hide, no matter how well you do, no matter how much money you make. You can't build a wall high enough to guarantee you clean air. You can't build, you can't hide enough to not be degraded by your, your sister not being able to marry the woman she loves. You can't hide from the fact that you're diminished when one of your friends is profiled. You can't escape. You can't escape. And I'm absolutely confident this is the single best educated, the single most informed generation in American history. And there's not a damn thing we can't do. I believe that with every fiber in my being. As Billy will tell you at the White House, I was always referred to by the press and others as the White House optimist, like I'm the new kid. Am I joking, Billy? I mean, but I am. Because I know the history of the journey of this country. When you give ordinary people a shot, man, they do extraordinary things. The American public has never, ever, 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 ever let us down. And so there's so many things we can do to get this moving, but you can't stand on the sidelines. You can't stand on the sidelines. Mr. Vice President, thank you for your leadership. Thanks, John. Is that okay? That was terrific.